morning, everyone. As it's still morning, now it's now afternoon. <laughs> if we were in Spain, it would be morning. So. <laughs> <That'd> be <amazing. laughs> um, well, welcome to this panel on queer heterotopias. My name is Lyra Montero, and I'm going to be acting as chair and then also giving a final presentation in this session. Um, the way that we're going to structure this in order to kind of maximize our small amount of time and also um, the ability to engage with each of the papers and then think of them all together is that um, we'll, we'll be presenting in the order in the program. Um, after each presentation, we're going to have time for two audience questions about that particular paper um, before moving on to the next one. And then after the last paper and its two audience questions, all of the panelists are going to come back up so that we can have a bit of a conversation about, well, the papers in conversation with each other and thinking about them that way. Okay? So, um, so we're going to get started uh, right now with um, the first presentation. Is that, no, it's not going to be. Um, so our first presenter is Danielle Valtuena, who is a PhD student here at the CUNY Grad Center in the PhD program in Latin American, Iberian, and Latino cultures. He earned his BA in art history at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, and his research focuses on contemporary Iberian theater and performing arts and queer contemporary culture in the peninsula. So, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Um, so, the title of my presentation is uh, Heterotopian Flamenca Exploits, a Charadox Nino de Elche. And I want to thank uh, the organizers of this conference to organizing this amazing uh, venue and the opportunity to, to be here today presenting this uh, still open and ongoing uh, paper. So I'm very, uh, looking, I'm very much looking forward to um, your questions and your comments because I'm still thinking on uh, Nino Delta's practice and music. And I wanted to start with an anecdote um, because in 2016, Nino de Elche performed at the Museo Nacional Central de Arte Reina Sofia in Madrid. And um, he said that the auditorium where he was performing was going to be transformed by his music into a feminist and vegan flamenco tavern. So I really liked that concept and this statement um, made me think about how physical spaces, how physical venues are commodified, the way they are tacitly or explicitly ruled, and from my point of view more important, how might be modified. Um, for those of you that uh, don't know uh, Niño de Elche, Niño de Elche, whose real name is Francisco Contreras Molina, uh, was born in Spain in 1985, and he's a musician and a performer who began his career as uh, well, one of the most promising voices in the flamenco scene, uh, but however his music moved away from the traditional flamenco sphere into uh, contemporary practice. Um, so some of his albums are Si Amiguel Hernández, released in 2013, um, dedicated to uh, the poet, to Miguel Hernández. Then in 2015, um, he um, released his album Voces del Extremo, who was like a very important album for, for his career. And this year, his album uh, called Antología del Cante Flamenco Heterodoxo uh, was a very important e event in the uh, musical uh, sphere in, in Spain. Um, but I also want to focus on his more like performative um, side um, and I want to highlight, highlight uh, his show Back on Back on, Cantar las Fuerzas, uh, who was uh, premiered in 2011 and inspired by Francis Bacon's paintings and also his latest, his latest La Farsa Monea uh, that he created with Pedro G. Romero and the dancer Israel Galvan and they presented this show in Documenta 14 Castle last year in 2017. And I think uh, the way Nino Delta works is very much about collaboration and he has collaborated with uh, a lot of artists and also scholars, including uh, Pedro G. Romero. Pedro G. Romero was the artistic director for uh, the Antología del Cante Flamenco Terodoxo. And also he has collaborate, collaborated with um, Israel Galvan's La Fiesta, the show that was premiered in Avignon uh, and is still on tour. 
and also they here's a picture of uh, the show uh, La Fiesta um, created by uh, Israel Galvan and also with the participation of Nino de Elche as a singer and um, they also collaborated in this show that they premiered this year called uh, Coplas uh, Mecánicas and they presented this show in the uh, Electronic Music Festival Sona in Barcelona. So this is just to give you a sense of how uh, Nino Delce's practice and music looks like. But this presentation uh, aims to reflect on the emulation of an alternative and non-normative flamenco space by Nino Delce's music and also performance. Um, to do so, I will call on Paul B. Preciados ideas on non normative bodies, as well as Michel Foucault's thoughts on heterotopia. Uh, both theorists, from my point of view, will help me to address Nino de Elche's latest project, Antología del Cante Flamenco Heterodoxo. And for my analysis, I do not want to focus just on the album or on the uh, music that is part of this specific cultural object. I also want to pay attention to other paratexts that were around the, the album and that are still around the album. So Nino Elche uh, defines himself as an ex-flamenco singer. Um, his first album, uh, called Mis Primeros Llantos, was released in 2007 when he was just 22 years old and it belongs musically to a more traditional period of his career and when, as I said, he was a successful winner of several cante competitions. Um, actually, in a recent Instagram post that he posted uh, with the album, with a picture of the album, um, his comment was, Cosas de mi otra vida. So, I think this statement really underlines the idea of his flamenco self, that it's part of his past life, but at the same time, uh, we could say that it's dead or at least belonging to the past. So this dialectic, this dialectic is really what interests me. Um, his last project, Antología del Cante Flamenco Heterodoxo, uh, has nothing to do with this early project, um, the Mis Primeros Llantos. Antología is a compendium of 27 songs that puts on the question hermetic and non permeable notions frequently associated to flamenco music. Um, and at this point, I would like to share with you, as I was saying that I wanted to focus on paratexts related to this project, how um, Antología, um, like the Antología del Cante Flamenco de la concerts start. Um, we had the opportunity to, um, to, to, see what, to listen to one of these concerts here in New York uh, in March, and uh, in the frame of the New York Flamenco Festival, and they start with Nino de Elche entering the States, uh, wearing casual, casual clothing, um, he gets naked, and changes his clothes for a black suit, because maybe uh, a black suit is supposedly meant to be the right thing an orthodox, not an heterodox cantaor would wear for a concert. And this is exactly how um, he looks in the cover of the album. Uh, it's a very, uh, apparently, it's a, like a very traditional image, but he is somehow parodying this traditional um, um, appearance that usually flamenco artists have. And I think this debate is very related to our discussion before, so I think it's going to be very interesting to hear what, what you think. This performative action uh, explicitly demonstrates, from my point of view, how Nino de Elche deals with tradition and also with identity, uh, both acknowledging his cultural background and at the same time parodying the institutions that commodify them. Um, when queer theorists, um, uh, theorist Paul B. Preciado began his gender transition for legal purposes, he found his position to be similar to what uh, refugee uh, bodies experience, because during exile, refugees do not belong neither to their countries of origin nor to the ones they inhabit. Uh, so legally, following here Preciado, their bodies don't exist. 
Preciado argues that this kind of exile is also experienced by transgender individuals, since they remain in an ambiguous legal status that makes the actual existence of their bodies a little bit dubious. Um, so following this line of thought, uh, Nino de Elche's ex-flamenco condition reveals its dependence on a land of origin, flamenco tradition, where he was trained, uh, but to which he no longer belongs, but at the same time it, remain, it remains present in his body of work and also in his actual body and the way he sings flamenco and other, um, other musics. So this constant negotiation uh, allows us to extrapolate, from my point of view, uh, Judith Butler's notion of gender performativity to Nino de Elche's body and practice. It could be said that Nino de Elche performs tradition in a similar way gender is performed, following here uh, Butler, Butler's explanation in Gender Travel. However, like Preciado argues in his Controsexual Manifesto, and I quote, El género no es simplemente performativo, es decir, un efecto de las prácticas culturales lingüístico-discursivas, como habría querido Judith Butler. El género es ante todo prostético, es decir, no se da sino en la materialidad de los cuerpos, es puramente construido y al mismo tiempo enteramente orgánico. So here Preciado is going one step further, so um, he's arguing that gender is not uh, only performed, but it's also like part of our actual bodies and it has like a prosthetic um, meaning or a prosthetic manifestation. So tradition is not just a cultural construction but also a, com a commodification that conveys physical consequences. The way we move, the way we talk, the way we dance, the way we sing in Niño de Elvis's case. Preciado uh, not only addresses gender, but also sex. Sex is defined in his Controsexual Manifesto as, and I quote, a biopolitical technology of heterosexual domination. And I think tradition, flamenco tradition in our case study, also is aligned with this notion of biopolitical domination, because it's both, and in our case, performed and claimed by Niño de Elche's ex-flamenco voice. Uh, from my point of view, his singing acknowledges traditional modes of singing, but at the same time challenges them by using his body, including his voice as part of um, his body, in a non-normative manner. Um, so in this regard, I want to share with you a very illustrative uh, example that I think we are all going to enjoy, because Niño de Elche, in a late night TV show in Spain, uh, was asked to perform uh, his version of the Spanish National Anthem. Uh, so. Let's see if it works. the video. I have, I have the video with me, so I think that's the, it's very, um, it, you know, it's a big document, so maybe that's why it's not. Let's try and if it doesn't work. Uh, okay, if it doesn't work. Okay, that's okay. Okay, well, it's a bit because it's very, it's very funny. Uh, but basically, he reinterprets the national anthem, like including this kind of very um, um, experimental, um, way of singing and somehow criticizing the national anthem as a symbol and as an institution that, you know, like um, 
very much don't represent all the diversity in a country like Spain. So I'm going to continue. Um, So, his version of the national anthem that uh, we cannot um, listen to um, <laughs> contests uniform discourses and challenges the category of na nation and its symbols. And we could say that flamenco is a symbol, institutionally talking, of the Spanish identity. By confronting a national institution such as the Spanish anthem, um, Nino de Arte's practice is claiming for an alternative place for his music to be performed. Um, and precisely by doing, so, by doing so, like a speech act would do, he's at the same time making this new scenario possible. So I argue that he's not just criticizing uh, these uh, institutions that commodify national identities and flamenco identities, but by performing a new way of understanding these, um, these identities, he is creating the actual space for these um, new identities to actually perform. For this reason, I think uh, the notion of a chartopia is precisely what Nino de Elche pursues with his practice. Um, Michel Foucault in theorizes um, a chartopia in some of his texts uh, opposing them to utopias, since the latter utopias are placeless places. However, heterotopias do occur in a specific place and time, and Foucault reflects on how physical spaces are commodified by the rules that govern them. He argues, and I quote, that a certain theoretical desintification of a space has occurred, but we may still not have reached the point of a practical disintegration of space. And, and perhaps our life is still governed by a certain number of oppositions that remain inviolable, that our institutions and practices have not yet, have not yet dared to break down. So in some way, I think uh, flamenco and the places it is performed, some of the places it is performed, it still preserves some of this sacred condition. And I think that Nino de Elche's practice precisely seeks for a desantification of the flamenco space. His music and performative actions, performative shows that the ones I, I showed you, challenges a non-permeable and unified idea of flamenco. Niño, Niño de Elche, among other artists before uh, him and many others to come, of course, I'm not talking uh, about him as the only one that um, does this, but I think uh, it's a very good example. Um, he does not renounce to his flamenco background because he, consider, he considers himself an ex-flamenco singer, but still flamenco is there, or he was there at some point. So. Um, he doesn't renounce to this flamenco background, but on the other hand, by challenging its institutional features, the institutional features of the flamenco, he's able to propose an alternative space, maybe an heterotopia, where these institutions and practices are broken down by a more heterodox approach. So I argue, and I conclude with this, that his music, from my point of view, makes this feminist and vegan flamenco tavern closer <laughs> to come. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for two questions right now. Can I? I'm, yeah, if you want I, to I'm very much looking uh, for. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, because I think it's, you know, um, really important to uh, listen to what he does, because I think it's, it's actually more illustrative than my words. Um, so, I was actually hoping you were going to sing me. Um, no, 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 I, can, I cannot do that. I, I cannot. <laughs> Ex 
España, 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 Okay, so is um yeah uh so I, I was I, I wanted to show you this because I think it actually gives you a sense of what, what uh, he does and how his music looks like. Um, yeah, so I'm very much looking uh, uh, forward to your questions, if you have. The thing is, he's questioning the flamenco um, aesthetics to the core, but he's not um, giving up performing in flamenco festivals. He's, yeah. he's, he's still under the label. Um, yeah, I do agree with that. Um, so he performs in flamenco festivals. For example, he performed uh, yeah. Uh, yeah in the Biennale uh, last month, or I don't know in September, right? In the, yeah, in the, um, the tours of the yeah the Maestranza. yeah exactly with Israel Galvan exactly. But I think um, uh, you can find a lot of contradiction in his practice, and he's totally fine with that. But I think at the same time he is very much happy with the idea of kind of subverting tradition from the inside and kind of at least having the opportunity to ha have a space for crit for criticism inside the own institution. But I think it's very healthy for, no, uh, for, 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 for flamenco festivals. But yeah, like it's um, very, you know, it's, it's, I think with this project, with Antologia, is so much more evident because it's a project related to flamenco. In other projects, for, exa for example, Voces del Extremo, um, he performed in electronic um, music festivals because it was more like the uh, venue for this kind of projects. And I think also there is a lot, we were talking about that uh, in the last uh, panel, that it's also how market and how cultural policies and how cultural festivals and the secrets and how it works. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can find that contradictions and I, and I think they are part of his I think, kind of, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know this video. This is response to Marta Sanchez. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to, I was going to bring that uh, to my paper, but I, I didn't want to get into this um, debate. Uh, but basically, it, it's just to sum up. There was um, like a an event by uh, by uh, the political party Ciudadanos. Um, with the participation of Marta, Marta Sunset, a singer. Um, and Marta Sunset created uh, new lyrics for the Spanish national anthem. And she sang this uh, anthem in this event that it was supposed to be an event for Spanish to be proud of their national identity. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be as objective as I can. Uh, so it was very... Um, it, 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 it went viral um, because it was like very funny to um, see her singing these very, you know, like, um, well, these this, uh, lyrics and people criticizing her and people criticize her and people start to also made fun of them. So it was actually like a very important thing that week. So I, this interview took place at the same moment and Andrea Buenafuente, um, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, host, yeah, thank you, the host for the, for the, for the show, uh, he asked him to create his own version. So somehow um, Marta Sánchez, we could say that Marta Sánchez's uh, version is kind of creating a very uh, political correct and very kind of you trying to unify um, Spain as a country and I think Mino Delce is very you know interested in finding the um, 
you know, like the things that what what a Spanish what a national anthem uh, represents and how a unified um, discourse uh, is uh, very dangerous, uh, sometimes ridiculous, and also like yeah, not very appropriate in the uh, um, you know in our. Uh, context in our Spanish, yeah, no, context. The thing is that the Spanish national anthem is a 200 year old piece of music, maybe? Yeah, it was, it used to be the, like, the Royal, Royal March. Name. It, was, it the used Royal to be the March. Royal March, yeah. But <laughs> even despite of that time, Spaniards cannot agree on a set of lyrics for that, for that piece of music. Yeah. We cannot agree on a set of lyrics for that. So yeah. There's no of, lyrics, yeah. There are, there are no lyrics, no official lyrics to it. Yeah, so we cannot agree on that, so. Yeah. I think it's part of the controversy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. supposed to do this when we had them, so apologies for not using it before. All right, so our next speaker is Ryan Rockmore, who is an independent researcher and a queer flamenco artist, a former Fulbright grantee who com completed his MA in Dance Anthropology from Roehampton University in London. His research focuses on the intersections of identity politics, gender performance, and flamenco. As an artist practitioner, his work centers on exploring expressions of masculinity and uses of props in a queer flamenco context. He has most recently presented work at Dixon Place and as an inaugural artist in residence with the Flamenco Vivo Cardo de Santana. And today he's going to be speaking on Queering the Tale of the Skirt, the Feminine History and Contemporary Male Appropriation of the Spanish Tail Skirt. Uh, first, I just also like to thank um, the committee and the organizing board for giving us space and allowing me to revisit a thesis that I wrote five years ago. It's always nice to sort of revisit a different time of your life and where you were. Um, and to see the threads, you gave a lot of a good platform, I think, for me to go off of and not have to explain so much of some of the theory in a way. So, thank you. Um, so there will be some videos here. You can watch them as you listen uh, at certain points. So. During a flamenco dance class in February 2012, an encounter with a three-year-old Spanish girl served as a catalyst for this project. For nine months, between 2011 and 2012, I was conducting ethnographic research and participating in a professional training program in flamenco dance at the Centro de Arte Flamenco de Sevilla. Although my focus was, on a broader level, the role of gender in flamenco dance, I felt it important to a role in the Bata de Cola class for six months to expose myself to the feminine movement style and this female-specific prop even if I was the only male in the class. On this cold, wintry morning, as our teacher, Asuncion Perez Lachoni, guided us through passages and exercises, the female toddler exclaimed from the door, Pero los chicos no hacen eso. But boys don't do that. Everyone chuckled, but I found myself as a gay American male dancer, an outsider in this space, confounded by what had just transpired. Was I doing something culturally wrong? Was I, as a man, not supposed to dance in a skirt? Was I overstepping some impermeable boundary of being, performing, dancing as a male? As a result, these questions led to the following research on the current phenomenon of the male flamenco dancer and his relationship to the Bata de Cola. Theories arguing the body as a social construct with meaning written upon, ascribed to, and derived from it are commonplace among academics now. Insofar that the body is the primary vessel for a dancer to present themselves, this allows the body to be instrumental in the presentation and performance of the artist in society. Anthropologist Susan Reed has addressed that this presentation of human movement carries with it political consequences with reference to the artist's gender, ethnic origins, and nationality, for example. In effect, what we as audience members witness in the performance space can be interpreted as an externalization of the performer's various internal identities. If we consider gender for a moment, the philosopher Judith Butler, who makes another appearance, elaborated on theories from the field of performance studies by focusing on gender and sexuality. By destabilizing the belief that gender is something fixed, natural, and inherent, later to be externalized, Butler argued in her reviewed article that 
the gendered body acts its part in a culturally constricted space and enacts interpretations within the confines of already existing directives. As such, one makes individual choices, but within the confines of how society is taught one how to act, present, etc., as that gendered self. This is particularly relevant to the field of dance because in order to attain a constructed, directed self, one could perform artistically and theoretically gender through a stylized repetition of acts, as Butler later puts it. The gestures and movements of the dancing body could serve to perform a gendered identities and sexed bodies, and these gestures and movements would exist within a certain historical cultural framework. In a previous article, I have demonstrated how male flamencos perhaps did this during the Franco era, further establishing a male flamenco aesthetic steeped in patriarchal, fascist, and Catholic corporeal and cultural values. The gender they performed and staged persona they constructed, further reifying expectations of how the male flamenco dancer should look, fell within and helped shape the confines of socially constructed expectations of Spanish men during the period. Beyond the body, however, what role do props such as the Bata de Cola have in fermenting this performance? And what about the Bata's historical lineage from a symbol of femininity for women to an appropriated prop by men makes it fertile ground to destabilize the very constructs of gender and gender performance? Through understanding the over 10 year phenomenon of bailaores dancing with the Bata de Cola, one can view this and other transcendent practices, if they can be considered as such, as parts of a larger movement. Whether this new movement aesthetic will provoke a global shift or simply remain a marginalized, commoditized, and exoticized divergence remains to be seen. Nevertheless, the possibility exists that the Western conceptualizations of how a man dances, dresses, and acts are due for a transformation. Pioneered by La Mejorana and originating from the French court dresses of the 18th century and succeeding the, the regional Andalusian skirts, the Bata de Cola differentiated itself by its longer tail skirt than the dance attire of the time. Regardless of the fashion or trend of the era, including now, there are three constants to the Bata de Cola, a trailing length of fabric, at least one or two layers of ruffles on the top side of the dress, and a frontal length covering the shins. What is done with these elements gives character and recognition to the performer. Three maestras were considered for this presentation, Malti de Coral, Merche Esmeralda, and Milagros Menjibar, each apporting her own style and personality to this icon of femininity. Coral devoted her life to performing and teaching the Escuela Sevillana aesthetic, which she described in an interview as, quote, plateresque, refreshing dancing, a reflaxed flamenco, a flamenco with precious shapes, end quote. This style could also be considered the purest representation of traditional femininity in flamenco, Esmeralda, a former student of Coral's, described this femininity through, quote, the richness that she has from the waist up, the cambrai, her shoulders, a hip, the waist, the look, end quote. And Menjibar expressed admiration for the Bata de Cola, something she adamantly believed should remain in the female flamenco dancer's vocabulary. With varied views on a theme, all three share critiques of current bailaoras and the potential loss of this femininity in the form. Very specifically, bailaores such as the Antiguapas, including Belen Maya and Pastora Galvan. A denomination penned by flamenco dance historian Michelle Hefner Hayes, the Antiguapas placed themselves outside the limitations of what it meant to be a bailaora and pushed the boundaries for the current generation of female flamenco dancers, whether through experimentation of traditional flamenco movement, inclusion of non standard costumes, both masculine and, ca and casual attire, or queering relationships between bailaoras and other performers. Some of this was done through the Bata de Cola. With Maya and Galvan, there is a certain aggression and or choreographic innovation that underscores their use of the dress. Maya often allows the Bata to turn it inside out and the ruffles to fold over. She treats the dress at times as if it were a, quote, cleaning rag. And Galvan kicks at her Bata de Cola, castigates it and, and cajoles it, as one critic once described. At once inventive, it also communicated a desire to free themselves of the traps placed on women the costumes, the limitation of movement, and the prescriptive aesthetic. By treating the Bata de Cola as a synecdoche for femininity and bailaora ordinance, standing in for it, the dis disobedience towards conventional techniques and aggressivity with the dress demonstrated, uh, sorry, Maya and Galvan's distancing from expected norms. Yet, as they continue to move beyond, beyond the historically accepted ways of using the dress, they reframe or resituate these experimentations by integrating movements within the recognized codes of flamenco. This subversion of and submission to classic codes make their actions radical enough to push traditional boundaries, but familiar and entertaining enough to be readily consumable by audiences and critics. Important to note here 
these are the views of them. Important to note here is that as displayed in Fernando El de Triana's historic 1935 collection of flamenco photos from the late 19th and early 20th century, bailaoras have been performing in male clothing or drag since the practice was initiated by Trinidad Huertas La Cuenca, later popularized by Carmen Maya, along with the mentioned contemporary Antiguapas. On the other hand, men have not been afforded the same stylistic freedom of perhaps drag in their performance of flamenco dance due in part to societal homophobia and legal punishment of homosexual acts during the Franco dictatorship, whereby a man wearing a dress would certainly be, would certainly garner suspicion and accusation. While not an overall rejection of the traditional femininity heralded by the maestras discussed earlier, the Antiguapas saw and seek to expand the limits of the codes that they inherited through training and watching women before them, blurring the tropes of traditional femininity and masculinity. Yet two other current figures in the flamenco world, Rafael Carrasco and Asuncion Perez Lachoni, have been changing the face of the Escuela Sevillana while still remaining true to its roots. They both serve as the only two women that my research found to have choreographed men dancing in the Bata de Cola. Through separate interviews, they revealed commonalities in how they share a desire to both experiment with the dress and respect the foundations of their technique. Carrasco and Perez entered the professional arena in the 1990s after training with Coral and Menjibar, respectively, during which, as Perez expressed, there were very few people that danced with the bata. She recounted how the baile canastero, or racial, of the traditional gitano style was highly popularized, along with the, tran along with the transgressive ventures of the Antiguapas. Although this style did not forgo certain complements, like the shawl or hair accessories, others, like the bata, castanets, or fan, experienced much less usage. Invoking Coral's judgment again right now, the 90s were, quote, the worst moment for the bata, as the male style of dancing became popular for women, and, quote, everyone wanted to come out wearing trousers. <laughs> Giving merit to Coral's viewpoint, although the continuation of the traditional aesthetic might be seen as a perpetuation of women restricted to costumes, flirtation, and minimal footwork, she, along with Esmeralda and Menjibar, advocates for women to own this position. For them, the bata is not necessarily a limiting object, but rather an accessory that belongs to women, is controlled by women, and exudes the most female quality belonging to women, femininity, which is to be protected. Regardless of the societal expectations that have placed them in this position of silent performing, and as film scholar Laura Mulvey would say, to be looked at-ness, the maestras own and master, not subvert, the femininity, coquettishness, and the accessories that have been relegated to them. After years of training and performing, Carrasco and Perez departed from their older maestras through their relationships with the bata, and this shift will serve an important role to the future male appropriation that we'll see. What we start to see is the perfect recipe, a rejection by women of, a rejection by women of traditional feminine props, two female pioneers looking to experiment, and a group of gay men in post-Franco Spain looking to push boundaries. Whereas for Coral, the dress was an accessory that one dominates, both Carrasco and Perez view the bata differently. As Carrasco explained, dancers are, quote, in service of the bata, almost in order to give more importance to it than to the bailaora. Quote, it is the bata and you, not you with the dress. Maldita Coral's idea seems to be that the dancer initiates a movement and the bata responds. Yet I would argue that Carrasco takes this a step further in that the dancer initiates or calls the bata to which the bata responds, and then the dancer must respond to that response. A dialogue of sorts, perhaps. As Coral described it, Quote, they give more protagonism to the bata de cola than to the dance. Also implementing more, as she says, malabares, or juggling tricks. Through this, there is almost a dual sense of agency that is offered to both the dancer and the bata in the contemporary technique of the dress through Carrasco and Perez, likely an approach that was not utilized by dancers of the older generation. While Perez echoed Carrasco's agency to the dress, she focused less on a technical separation and more on a fundamental connection that must join the dancer with the dress so that both may act individually and as one. Different approaches that are also present in the male practice with the prop. Insofar that the shawl or fan, for example, are accessories that the dancer can discard in the middle of the performance, the bata is an extension of Perez. It forms, quote, it forms part of you as if it were your third leg. It is your skin. In this poetic sense, the dancer and the dress form a matrimony by which two become one. In our interview, Perez felt that the bata almost has a life of its own and that the dancer must constantly listen and respond to, quote, her in order for this unity to form. After decades of technical codification and stylistic expectations for women wearing the bata, both Perez and Carrasco found themselves reaching a limit that required traversing. 
Popular belief in the flamenco and dance worlds credit Joaquin Cortez in his show Sol as the first man to dance in the bata. However, this seems untrue as Rafael Carrasco maintains that, quote, it was nothing more than an adornment, and previous attempts were either travesty, drag, or dramatic, rather than flamenco dance performances. First, in her 2005 production, Una Mirada del Flamenco, for the Festival de Jerez, which draws a large traditional audience typically, Carrasco choreographed a farruca for three bailadores, not seen here, Manuel Niñan, Marco Flores, and Daniel Doña. This served as the first documented instance where men performed on stage in the bata, and her clear intention was to, quote, search for the masculinity of the bata de cola rather than a man's femininity. As there were, quote, certain things that she didn't dare do with the bata, end quote, men became her tool for exploring more possibilities with the dress. As you see here, even wearing sleek silver batas in a Sevillanas from her 2008 production of Vamos al Tiroteo, everything about the men above the waist reads strongly masculine, with severely angular or straight arms, erect postures, and pronounced chests. Their choreographed patterns are also distinctly masculine, with quick, upright terms, turns, dominating strides across the floor, and clean, precise movements. The treatment and use of the dress is also aggressive, as the men seem to kick the bata out of the way as they execute various passages. Some of these terms I'm using come from more recent anthropological understandings of Cristina Curses Rudan, where she's outlined sort of what's feminine and what's masculine. Not necessarily what I would say. Although the phrase has been used with other connotations, such as drag or transvestism, these dancers read more as men in a dress. They are men dancing in the traditional masculine style with a dress covering their legs. Already challenging gender roles and expectations of gendered performance, perhaps this type of masculinity of the movement vocabulary and execution made the creation approachable, marketable, and inoffensive to a traditional general public. Much like Carrasco's desire to search for another mode of expression from the bata, Perez hoped to find how men could offer a, quote, masculinity to the bata, and also potentially, quote, change the aesthetic of the dress. In her 2008 show, Tejidos al Tiempo, she choreographed a duet, Dos en Compañía, with contemporary and contact dancer Manuel Cañadas, in an effort to explore the bata technique from the outside rather than from within. Whereas Carrasco's men danced with their dresses individually, almost all of Cañadas' movements seemed to either place the bata on Perez for her to interact with it outside of the dress or appear to be initiated by Perez in a miming fashion. This is to say that she utilizes her legs and body as if she were wearing the dress without necessarily touching it, and Cañadas moves the bata accordingly as though she had made contact. He was the conduit that made her relationship with the dress possible. The accessory was attached to one body, but it responded to multiple dancers and became transitory in nature. Perez and Carrasco made great advancements in the technique and use of the bata de cola through the inclusion of bailaores, but the 2000s led to further appropriation by male dancers. With an increased ability to control their own stage image using this historically feminine prop, male flamenco dancers have both added to the language of the bata and reformed traditional notions of masculinity in male dancers. Recently, Fernando Lopez Rodriguez, in his recent queer analysis of flamenco history, De Puertas para Dentro, presented the early 2000s as a prime moment for queering and transgressing the norms of flamenco dance by certain artists. Within this context, I would suggest that Bailaudes took hold of the previously feminine bata that was up for grabs and introduced new possibilities to the male flamenco dancer's stylistic and choreographic possibilities. Manuel Niñan has the greatest international recognition of all the men I studied. His ability to choreograph with feminine props for male female dancers, especially bailaores that are considered experts of the bata, like Carrasco, differentiates him in the flamenco field from his contemporaries. David Romero is a figurehead of the Barcelona flamenco scene and provided some of the earliest social media representation of men dancing in the dress, sometimes just of him teaching a class. Whereas Lignan and Romero are both of Spanish descent, the third bailaor I looked at, Fabian Tomé, is originally from France but studied Danza Española at the Royal Conservatory of, in Madrid. Much like Romero, Tomé was never formally instructed to dance in the bata de cola, but he learned only by watching girls in class and performances. Yet a key difference to Tomé's utilization of the bata is that his choreographies are not done with flamenco music and his bodily and his bodily movements are often experimental and contemporary, falling outside of the traditional flamenco canon. The final bailaor of the group is Los Angeles-based Timo Nunez. Even though he has studied mostly with men, he emphasized a great respect for the fem female props and the feminine aesthetic. This respect led him to incorporate the female style into his choreograph choreographies through his 20s. 
On a cursory level, he and Lin Yan are similar in their anti guapa esque treatment, at times more aggressive and brute with the, with the bata de cola. Yet, with this introduction of men dancing in the dress, what if we focus on the bata as a prop, temporally and spatially separated from the men and their intentions? By first labeling the bata as a prop that can be treated as nothing but fabric and ruffles, how is it, quote, inactive, while not on the human body? Can the dress only assume meaning and create effects once the male or female flamenco dancer's body has occupied it? Much like a catalyst in, the chem in chemistry that has no effect outside of a chemical reaction, once the bata joins itself with the reactants, the dancing bodies, it becomes instrumental to facilitating a resulting product, presence, or viewing, another type of dancer. Even though Perez claimed that the bata is something that cannot be disconnected, from the body like a shawl or fan, this is precisely what Fabian Tomei, David Romero, and I have done in our choreographies. Tomei is seen struggling to walk across the stage, even inching like a caterpillar at times, and constantly falling, with sudden movements, disjointed limbs, and angular arms. The black bata sits neatly placed in the center of the stage, waiting for him. Once he enters the dress and places it on his body, he suddenly takes new forms. You see he glides across the floor with his legs and attitudes, a pronounced chest, flowing arms, and embodies a relaxation not seen previously in the choreography. The piece ends with him removing the dress, hobbling to the side, and slowly falling once again. Alone, it remains a pile of cloth, center stage, separated from me, but represents memories of a murdered loved one. Gets dragged by Romero, like a proud torero with a dominated object, or here, sits clumped up, clumped up next to Tomé, but on each of us, it activates a complete change of character and look. Acting as a link between the present and its feminine history, perhaps the bata acts or activates as a sort of hyphenation, existing between masculinity and femininity, only taking meaning and interpretation upon its attachment to a gendered body. The bata allows the male flamenco dancer to become a, quote, perhapser, as coined by Avanti Maduri, a self-stylized magician playing at everything without inhabiting any one space exclusively. Neither appearing entirely no male nor female, yet a body playing with both styles and wearing clothes, wearing articles coded as masculine and feminine. Part of the entertainment of male flamenco dancers wearing the dress exists in this play between extremes. In a carnivalesque way, this is the effect achieved by Lignan and Nunez. Colorful, jubilant display, pardon, colorful displays by flashy batas in virtuosic technique with focused, jubilant, and celebratory attitudes as they toss the bata around the stage, commanding eruptive applause from the audience, inverting the expected performance of traditional masculinity by a male performer. The weakness of applicability and hindrance of descriptors like masculine and feminine to, to characterize the male flamenco dancer in the bata de cola expose a certain fallacy of gendered constructions within dance. Perhaps because of this, we have reached the moment when masculine and feminine have become products of what philosopher Jean Baudrillard described as, quote, a generation by models of a real without origin or reality, a hyper-real. Even if the use of a bata de cola or the integration of a movement coded as feminine by a bailaor seem to, reinforce, to reference the traditional feminine aesthetic, it only does so because society has now imagined this to be true. The bata is only feminine insofar that the feminine is signified by the bata, which makes the two entirely dependent on the other, yet at once baseless. They become a simulacrum, each simulating or representing the other, entirely void of referential meaning when separated. I'm gonna be queer right now and go a minute over my time. Apologies. <laughs> once out of the realm of the feminine, what opportunities does the bata afford us to question not only the very notions of gendered terms like masculine or feminine, but also limitations of movement and expression? Well, this is one isolated context in which male dan flamenco dancers are challenging the traditional notions of masculinity and male appropriate behavior, the presence of expansive masculinities and adoption of movements typically called as feminine by men is prevalent throughout the proverbial West. A recent case being the work of dancer Giannis Marshall as his trio advanced to the finals of the show Britain's Got Talent. By dancing in heels on the global stage, these men not only challenge traditional stylistic expectations of male dancers, these men but they also push the boundaries of what it means to, quote, dance like a man. Much like the bailaores here, Marshall's intent was never to dance like an, or emulate a woman. Rather, he wanted to present sensuality and sexiness in a way that are not often afforded to male dancers. Regardless of his identification as a gay male, by the way, all the men I've mentioned so far as well, but not all explicitly mention it, which carries with it stereotypes of effeminacy and appropriation of feminine traits, Marshall dances this way because it is a form of self-expression. When asked in an interview about his motives for dancing in heels, he simply responded, why not? Is it possible that we must protect the Bata de Cola's feminine status in history? 
as a historically female prop that has symbolized femininity and maintains linguistic capital as a female noun, la bata, now being dominated by men, can we strip the bata de cola of its womanhood? Are we to acknowledge Coral, Esmeralda, and Mejiras, please, to maintain the femininity of the baile femenino in this prop for future women to master and embrace? In order to protect her artistic innovations, I won't enumerate them, but if integrating roller skates is any sign of her future relationships with the Spanish tail skirt, for Lachoni, this prop's tale is far from over. Two questions. We can do one since I went over if you want. Okay. Or two. Well, we can do, well, all right, sure. We'll do one question now and then um, we'll be having, inviting all the panelists back up at the end for um, questions for everybody. So, one question right now. Pressure. Just got a really good question. I guess pre-2012, I didn't. I was actually in a, I started dancing with Flamenco Vivo in their group classes. Um, Maya de Silva was also one of my first teachers. But I started dancing with a female, and after five classes, a guitarist, Connie, came up to me and said, you shouldn't be studying with a female, you should be studying with a man. And so I started studying with Victorio Corjan, and that lasted for about two years, but I always felt like something was being imposed upon me, that it just not, it didn't fit well within my body to have to be so rigid and virile and, I don't know, I gravitated much more towards the feminine aesthetic. So when I got to Sevilla and was doing the Fulbright research, the primary concern was to not only study with men, but also start studying with women and see perhaps what it meant for me to separate my fingers, what it meant to put a hip in there, um, within the context of all of this happening. The bata wasn't really getting a lot of recognition in terms of male dancers at the time, so me being in a Bata class was still, I guess, relatively new. During that part. Cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so um, now I will act as chair and then become speaker in just a second. Um, my name is uh, Lyra Montero. I am a professor at Rutgers University in Newark, where I teach in American Studies and History and African American and African Studies. And um, I would say that my work really ranges very broadly over a lot of different fields. I, myself an undisciplined scholar um, and uh, my early training was in anthropology and classical archaeology actually um, which uh, and um, moving in, and, and moving into various fields of cultural studies and eventually hopefully ending up within dance studies um, is definitely a trajectory of mine but I will just say all of that by way of practicing the fact that this is this is literally my very first paper I've ever given about dance. And I'm super excited, but also um, you know, just a little nervous. Uh, but this so this is this is when people say, oh this is very preliminary work and usually it's like, you know, stuff they've been slaving over for a really long time. Yeah, this is very preliminary work. <laughs> anyway, so with that in mind. The thing about race and gender is that they are both all about categorization. 
And they're all about top-down structures that order people. Those captured on the African continent and forced into servitude in the Americas did not choose to become black, at least not at first. Infants do not choose to be boys or girls, yet those identities are also imposed upon them by their parents, by the doctors who deliver them, and by the other powers in their worlds. The thing about race and gender is that they are both all about the corporealization of power, about using supposed biological characteristics to define rights, access, behavior, and possibilities. The thing about the raced and gendered body is that it opens up the possibility for a rejection of such powers over it. There is a tendency to imagine African enslavement in the New World as a totalizing institution, one that controlled all aspects of the lives of every person that it caught in, it, in its grasp. There is no doubt that it was a profoundly restrictive institution, and one that was designed to degrade and to deny autonomy to those whom it declared to be subhuman. But it was, in fact, filled with negotiation, with space taking, with life reclaiming on the part of Africans held in bondage. The evidence of this negotiation is everywhere, even in something as straightforward as the fact that the enslaved were rarely kept in chains when not in transit or being subjected to punishment, and how in many regions at many times, they were given one or two days off from their labor for their owner. These are just two of many instances of the dance between control and power as it operated on both sides. I think about African enslavement in the New World a lot. It's a big part of my job. As a curator, as a professor, and as an artist, most recently, this past Saturday, I staged a major public intervention in front of the statue of George Washington in Union Square Park to bring attention to George Washington's role as an enslaver of hundreds of people. I think about trauma a lot. My personal experience of large-scale traumas, such as living through 9-11 as a downtown resident, the cumulative trauma of the daily microaggression I experience in this body, as well as the very intimate traumas of illness, of abuse, and of assault. Observing how I moved through, through them, and how others have over the years, has given me insight into the deep connections between the large-scale traumas, intergenerational trauma, and the development and engagement with different, different cultural forms. I also dance a lot. When I was, I was in fact two years old when my mother first convinced a dancer who was part of a long lineage to give me private lessons in Polynesian and Hawaiian dance. And I never stopped dancing or learning new dance forms. But the one that took up residence within this dancing body or perhaps the one that best fulfilled the needs carved into it, was flamenco. Racialized slavery, trauma, and dance. All three are central to my life, but until recently, I very intentionally cut the latter off from explicit intellectual engagement. Interestingly, one of the keys that unlocked that final corner of the triangle that I now wish to explore in ever greater depth appeared in connection not with race, but with the other central category of division and distinction and power with which I opened, gender. In the summer of 2017, I became aware with relief and enthusiasm of my gender identity, which is actually not something I figured out how to describe in words yet, so, oops, didn't come through. That's not my gender identity, I wish that was my gender identity. <laughs> 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 okay, wow, technology is always right, I have a theory about this, and okay, <laughs> so that just threw me, anyway, I'll skip that part for now, since I can't give you my visual I was intending to give you, um, alright, shortly thereafter, I flew to Spain to spend a few months of my sabbatical in Madrid, dancing between Amor de Dios and the Archive as I explored possible materials for a new book project. 
In the midst of this pleasant but familiar routine, one morning at the Biblioteca Nacional de España, I had a powerful, powerfully queer experience. After two hours of relatively uneventful images research, I called up the work of the photographer Juan Jiménez, specific, specifically his 1950s images of flamenco artists. I looked at some of these the previous day and in no way anticipated that it would be different today, but they were. And I have to admit, I was pretty much equally shocked when um, I opened the folder and that image stared out at me. Um, a small wallet-sized image with scalloped edge that, at edges that unmistakably showed Carmen Amaya. For some reason, the call slips hadn't been returned with the images, so I couldn't confirm, but come on. There was this powerful queerness in this particular folder of images. 29 of the 30 were of Amaya and her company. Sometimes she wore pants, and with Hines even writing on the back of one of the images that she was la primera bailadora que sabía bailar con pantalones, which is obviously not true, but you know. <laughs> he didn't put sabía in quotation marks, so maybe that's what he was trying to imply. <laughs> kind of in the same way Joaquin Cortez didn't really. Yeah. Um, in others, she ado adopted more traditionally feminine costumes, but her face retained its sternness, daring her viewer to pigeonhole her into the gender role otherwise so strongly enforced for women in Spain. The queerness of her body and the fundamental queerness embedded in flamenco came out most powerfully in a way, in the way in which that first posed studio image of her was so par powerfully juxtaposed with the image behind it, um, within the plastic folder inside of the, the larger folder. So that you might be able to guess is not, in fact, Carmen Amaya. Um, but for some reason, uh, within the cataloging sequence of these 30 images, all the rest of whom were either Amaya and her company, um, there was this image of a male dancer in concert, specifically of Antonio. And these images offered so much and did so much together, but the queerest thing that they did was offered what seemed to be the perfect illustration of gender as performance, rather than as biologically determined. The two dancers were, wore identical outfits, the main difference being her female shoes, but at that, at that size and, and, and at that ankle, you had to really look carefully to confirm that they were not a male boots. And their bodies were basically the same shape, her flat chest and narrow hips and wide shoulders, his hourglass figure. It all reminded me of, you know, the classic racist idea, right, of the Nazis, for instance, that Jews were recognizably different in appearance and yet somehow still needed to wear stars in order to be identified. These images show how much the same is true for the claims of biology as being that which separates men and women, both predating and profound, providing profound illustration of the critiques of gender by scholars from, okay, the two we've been mentioning all day, Butler and Preciado. In these images, I saw the possible reason for why flamenco had so easily taken root in my body at, from a young age. Indeed, from precisely the age at which gender policing becomes increasingly powerful. I started studying flamenco when I was 10, and my main teacher for the first eight years of study was a man. And while I would often dance in a dress, the steps I learned were the same as the men. And the solitariness of much flamenco performance in and of itself offered a sense of possibility to escape from gender, to escape from that dyad, that expectation that you are either one or the other. When only one body was on the stage, did gendering it matter so much? And now that I am opening my intellectual engagement with dance, alongside my previous scholarly commitments to the study of slavery and of trauma, and can theorize why and how an Africanist dance form performed by those most marginalized in Spanish society would also be the form most readily accompanied or accommodated, that most readily accommodated play with gender as small acts of rebellion within Franco's Spain. 
When I returned to the States last fall, I re-engaged with salsa dancing, the most, e one, most easily recognizable uh, as an Africanist dance of the three dance forms I'll be talking about in this paper. It is also by far the most heteronormative of those forms. Salsa is relatively fixed, and, but also fairly straightforward dance, one that has a comparatively low bar to entry, barrier to entry. Once that basic step is accessed, anyone can dance all night long. But for more experienced dancers, salsa quickly becomes all about the power exchange between the lead and the follow. With vanishingly few exceptions, the lead is male and the follower is female, and the man makes almost all of the decisions about how to work with the music. Literally directs the woman to follow in the mode, in the model that he has laid out. He releases her back, pushes her gently away to make room for a spin. Nope, it's gonna be two spins. Meanwhile, he repositions himself and holds out his hand to see, for her to see or take and continue in whatever direction that he leads. She is not entirely without autonomy. In fact, her very presence there, offering her body, taking the outstretched hand, is on some level a choice. And without her choice to turn over control of her body's movement, the dance simply doesn't happen. Just as historian Walter Johnson famously described the white slave owners of this country as slave-made men, the salsero is a partner-made man. His masculinity, his ability to demonstrate his skill and precision and knowledge of how to manipulate his partner's body are all predicated on having a partner with him to dance. And yet, even in this highly gendered dance, in which power is mostly one-sidedly in the hands of the man, the woman has power too. Beyond the choice of whether or not to take the hand offered as invitation or to walk away and dance. Her level of skill and flexibility shapes what is possible for the man to do and, and to ask her to do. And she can misread a cue, whether by choice or by accident, in a way that brings to mind the ubiquitous speculations in the journals and the, and the diary entries of overseers of enslaved Africans in the New World. Is this slave actually sick or are they pretending? Why is this slave always so much slower at doing the, than the rest at doing their job? Are they just being lazy? Or are they playing dumb in order to get out of their work? And what about the frequent breakage of those hoes? Are they actually that poorly made? Or are their wielders intentionally rendering their tools useless as an act of protest? And to possibly buy themselves a little leisure time. When she's being uncom held uncomfortably close, or touched in a way that she doesn't like, the salsera can take opportunities to step back, to release the other hand, to dance facing him but separately for as long as she chooses, ultimately. Again, missing the cues of her partner when he is ready to bring her back in. But again, these forms of resistance are just that, resistance. They are all that is accessible to those who are on the, the less, who are rather on the disempowered side of a highly patriarchal dance form. This comes out strongly in Colombian salsa singer Joy, uh, Joe Arroyo's song, La Re Rebellion, which was originally performed in 1986 and is a staple of nearly every salsa DJ in this city, at least. It is immediately recognizable for the singer's spoken introduction and stands out by, as by far the most overtly political and explicitly historical song among those played regularly for New York's dancers. Engaging the capacity of salsa for, its, for explicit invocations of Africanness, Arroyo sets the scene in the 1600s in Cartagena, telling what he describes as a story de la historia negra, de la historia nuestra, one of esclavitud perpetua. While it exalts racial resistance and rebellion, if you listen closely, it's really a remarkably and explicitly heteropatriarchal song. After setting the scene in the first voice, verse, Arroyo speaks of an enslaved African couple who are mistreated by their owner. The sight of his wife being beaten is what prompts the enslaved husband to rebel, and hence the name of the song. There's a lot to be done with the idea that, slave rebellion, that the slave rebellion that gets the most play among salseros is not one of the historically documented 
successful and meticulously planned mass revolts of Nueva España, but instead a man defending his honor by standing up to the man who has hurt his wife, or rather his woman. The lyrics suggest that he responded with violence to avenge his wife and was imprisoned for the act. Y aun si escucha en la verja, no le pegue a mi negra. These, these lines, called out from jail, are picked up by the backing singers and quickly turned into No le pegue la negra, which is really hard for me not to sing right now, which are practically the only words spoken for the rest of the song. I know that I love to dance salsa, and I know that I especially love dancing with a woman lead or watching two men dance together, so I decided to learn how to lead earlier this year. But aside from valuing how much it taught me to be a more skilled follower, I found that, lead, that leading entirely uninteresting to me. Being in charge of my partner in such a one-sided way, frankly, was not queer enough to sustain my interest. So instead, I turned to tango, which is a dramatically different dance form. There is no basic step in tango, one that you return to again and again within a dance or that beginners can repeat throughout an entire song nor is the 4-4 rhythm worked with in a way that is straightforward and predictable. Instead, it is much more like flamenco in its structure, in its responsiveness to the music and its improvisation. Before I began studying it, I found watching unchoreographed tango dancers completely baffling. I couldn't understand why they were moving when they did, how they were communicating with each other, how the dance worked with the music. Ultimately, the answer lies in, a far, in far more subtle communication between the lead and follow than in, than in salsa, a communication facilitated by the closer embrace, which is broken much less frequently than it is in salsa. Within this more complex structure and subtle communication, tango makes space for a far greater level of, controlled exercise, of control exercised by the follow. While some of the methods of follower resistance, as I'll call them, that I discussed above for salsa may apply in tango, there are in fact built-in moments for followers to call the shots throughout the dance, to make choices about how long they will take to move through the back ocho that the lead is framing for them, how long they will take to slowly drag their foot up the lead's leg, wrap it inside and kick it out again before placing it where the lead has signaled for it to go. In other words, if we were conceptualizing queerness as being about rejection of normativity, particularly around gender, gender and sexuality, tango is already, even when danced by a cis man leading a cis woman, decidedly queer. Thus, it makes a certain amount of sense that queer tango would be a thing, and that would be, it would be a thing that emerged long before there was queer theory with which to make sense of it. Over the summer, I started studying tango with the New York Queer Tango Collective. And what made it queer in this case was, yes, the sexual orientation of the dancers, but it was more than that. In my first workshop, for every new exercise we explored, we'd start by selecting a new partner, sometimes presenting as the same gender, sometimes not, and go through each exercise twice, once with one person leading and once with the other person leading. Later, as we learned the choreography that, was, that would be performed at the New York Career Tango weekend just last month, which this is actually an image from here, uh, that kind of switching was actually built into the same short dance as the lead shifted explicitly and visibly. Um, one partner explicitly leading at one point and visibly leading at one point and then the other partner immediately afterwards. So this very preliminary and personal typology of queerness and resistance within the Africanist dances of the Spanish Empire is built into, um, and seeing how it is built into these various dance forms represents my own explorations of my dancing body. One that is neither black nor white, one that is red as female, but is not. One that is still early in its process of integrating my academic training in the humanities with the dance forms that make up who I am. So we can take two questions, or one question, probably. It's already really late. Um, 
it's not a super academic question. Mm. Then I'm thinking about the spaces of doing like queer tango workshops mm -hmm. and what experiential or kind of methodological things you're drawing given that you're coming with this hybridity of archaeology and anthropology mm -hmm. to that as a research site or like what are you finding as the, the material for that kind of reflection? Can you, are you identifying particular kind of sensorial sites or kinesthetic sites? Mm -hmm. Sensorial, mm -hmm. kinesthetic. Right, in terms of like, yeah. yeah. Um, honestly, I would have to admit that I'm still early enough in this work mm -hmm. that I haven't been able to, that, that I'm not yet able to really articulate that. Um, I know that, you know, uh, that it's 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 definitely a very rich area to explore, and there's a lot going on. Um, and the people, you know, the group of people that are drawn to this these spaces is is very um, is a fascinating group of people, and the work that happens within them. Um, for instance, like there's less of it. There's often less of an investment in like the precision of of you know proper tango than in the fact that we are you know dancing it in the way that we are. Um, and that's been one thing that stood out to me. Um, another thing that stood out to me about the queer tango spaces that I've been in is that there are, uh, well, yeah, pretty much no black people in them, which is true of you know most of the other dance forms that I've mentioned as well in this country, and is you know a really big thing I think to be thinking about when we think about you know thinking about the Africanist roots of so much of this work. Of, 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 of these forms that we are indebted to. All right, I'll talk back up. All right, so for anyone who came in late, we decided that <laughs> we decided that we would start late. Uh, because of the other, the other session going late, and then that we would also still end with some time for questions. So, um, and for discussion across the panel and across the papers. researchers inform the way that you are teaching your students now? Like, what are things that you're doing differently that you didn't receive, or possibly the same that you received and you thought uh, worked well to guide you on a, a nice path? <laughs> um, I'm still a student, a PhD student here at the Graduate Center, and I teach Spanish as a second language. So when teaching Spanish, on when you look at the materials that are created for uh, teaching a second language, not a foreign language, that it's also another debate. Um, mm. It's very evident how, uh, like, usually teaching materials like fall in all these stereotypes and uh, binaries that we have been discussing here and we have discussed in the last panel. So um, I think, for example, I, what I can learn from my case of study, uh, like the one I presented uh, today, Nino de uh, Music and Practice, is how um, we shouldn't um, um, think that something like flamenco has just one definition. And I think thinking from a queer perspective is very, very much uh, interesting for us to think how Spanish as a second language, even though I'm from Spain and I have my own accents, my own words and my own uh, expressions, I cannot say, even if I in a uh, language course, that, that something is wrong, even though the textbook says that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there is like this um, dialectic between what norm normativity says and what it's actually happening in the class. So yeah, I think that um, teaching uh, even like a, a language like Spanish, that it's my case, 
from a queer perspective, it's not just about teaching, um, for example, now I'm teaching the family. So of course there is queer content there uh, that I'm teaching to my students, that it's not in the textbook, but it's not just about uh, very um, evident queer topics, but also thinking from a queer point of view. Uh, that is, I think, what is more, more interesting, that helps me to address Spanish as a language in a non-normative way. I guess to jump off of that, ditto to a lot of what you're saying, and I think I just went the route after the past, so I'm a Spanish teacher as well, but of throwing out the textbook, and I actually just started to create my own curriculum that like included gendered and non-gendered nouns in the family units and stuff like that. So as a teacher, I never thought of my practice as queer, but I guess it's like pretty queer. But in terms of flamenco, um, recognizing you right now also and the job that you do and my involvement in the community, I. I've been really hesitant to get involved as a teaching artist, actually, and I've expressed interest, but I still actually don't know or think if I want to do it um, because flamenco is something so queer and personal to me. I don't know how I would transmit that to a student body um, at certain ages, and I don't know how I would teach to certain students if there is at some point a a, a desire to learn like men do this and women use their hips how to avoid that. I haven't reconciled that with myself and my own artistic practice. Um, so I don't know if I'm quite sure ready. I don't know if I'm ready to teach that. In the last session, it was, I, I still consider myself very a teacher of Spanish, but an artist of flamenco. Um, I don't know if I'm a teaching artist yet. Yeah, I also definitely, definitely don't consider myself a teacher of flamenco. I mean, I've, I've taught flamenco in the past, but that's younger days before I thought very more critically about a lot of things. So, <laughs> and also, and also when I needed the money because I was a grad student. So, um, <laughs> how queer is flamenco? That should have been the title of our the session. Queer. Yeah. <laughs> the queer is what. <laughs> I wonder, I think a session like this is hard at times because it's sort of where do you want to also, what's your departure point of what queer is? So if, like, if also. I liked how you introduced yours, of, of, if we're taking it from a gender and sexuality perspective, then mm -hmm. like, I mean, I, that was from the 30s, the photo I showed, or maybe even the La Cuenca was maybe even earlier than the 30s, I forget exactly. But so women were doing non-womanly things, dancing in pants mm -hmm. back then and pushing boundaries. But then if you get in the more abstract sense of queerness, of queer just being the non-normative, mm -hmm. or queer just pushing a norm or a boundary, then I, again, it's about all about resistance and sort of apolitical at times and doing that. So it's been queer, I guess, from its start, I don't know, from its roots for today. But I feel like it's less open-minded. Well, if the question is like, you know, how much space does flamenco or the flamenco community today keeping in mind that there are, you know, flamenco communities in different places, but still, how much space does, does the flamenco community make for people who are queer, queer bodies, queer expressions, then I think that that's, you know, a different mm. question, mm. right? Um, and I, don't, I, I would be interested in your, in your experience of that. I mean, say what we want, flamenco vivo Carlota Santana was like really innovative for what they just did last year for their residency program that they did for me in Cianix. Um, in terms of a, an explicitly queer space for flamenco dancers, I had never seen that even in Spain or abroad. Um, and Madrid tried to do their LGBTQ flamenco festival, but none of the artists explicitly addressed it. They had Miguel Poveda sing, who's gay, but he didn't sing any gay songs and he didn't talk about his gayness. Mm -hmm. They had Rosy Molina do a dance, but she didn't dance anything explicitly queer in that sense. So, so how many flamenco male dancers are queer, but when they perform, they perform as males. So that go to Fernando Lopez Rodriguez's work, because then and he also, like he outs certain flamenco singers in that mm -hmm. book. He outs some dancers. The dancers they've all been out, but and they, and holding they were, the ones that were openly gay or openly queer were pushed aside as comedy. Like, like have you heard about La, La Esmeralda de Sevilla? <laughs> or El Teatro Chino de Manolita Chen. I always, there was this Teatro Chino 
Ch Chinese theater in which uh, in the Feria de Sevilla, in the, in the Seville Fair, in, well, in where there was the only space where queer or drag flamenco was meant to be. You know? um, and I think it's fantastic that now there are more, I mean, there are more instances in which that is being embraced. And I think it's, it's fantastic. You know? But it's, it's been either comedy or you act mm. as a male dancer or a woman, a mm. female dancer, even though you are queer or gay. Yeah, but I would add on that, that um, so flamenco as an institution is or what was reproducing the same, um, um, the same things that society and institution in the past um, were doing. Um, but what I'm afraid of is like by asking how queer flamenco can be, once we kind of um, say these artists are queer and are flamenco, they are going to be just queer flamenco artists. And it's going to happen something that it's very much related to what you were saying. Um, uh, with this example, like what happened in the past. So they are queer, they are openly gay, and they perform gender and sexuality in a different way, but they are, they have still this kind of... Um, yes, genre. Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, so I'm, I'm more um, interested in thinking queerness in uh, of course, gender and sexuality uh, space, but also in a broader sense that it's open to other things, because otherwise I think it's going to um, get a little bit complicated. Or can I have a question? Or also off of that, leaving it at the, like, the potentiality of that, of like leaving it as how fl queer can flamenco be, not with the intention of it will arrive to that, as like queerness is like an attainable thing, but like it will always it always can be more queer perhaps and leaving it there a little bit so then they're not pegged as i mean i've been told if you dance in a dress you're going to be the guy that dances in a dress and people yeah. were warning me like not to fetish. do that like that yeah like a fetish for example and then but now you have alvaro romero who's a queer singer and sings mass lyrics about men and he's really that's a project i'm working on now like that's something that's great you have hero Ferec, who's a guitarist in barcelona unapologetically queer um, and so you have these artists that are starting to sort of gain some traction. Uh, thank you very much for bringing this up. I think it's a very interesting topic. I've been very interested in understanding for years the relationship between masculine and feminine within flamenco, precisely because um, I'm recovering the pure female dancing. And I'm just bringing this to so just to give you a little perspective. Originally, flamenco women didn't do any work whatsoever. So they dance feminine with their skirts, very, you know, with their fans, with their shawls, all of that. And men did the food, right? Then, connecting with what you were just saying, feminine and masculine flamenco, it does not really directly relate to being queer or not queer, to be gay or not gay. It is an essence in the dance. For instance, Carmen Amaya herself, she was not, at least in the open, a lesbian woman, she was married, loved her husband, and always declared this deep love for her husband. It's true that, as it's been said, anyway. So the point is that there is also, the, what I'm trying to get at with this is that Carmen Amaya created a revolution in flamenco because she began dancing like a man, dressed like a man, and doing any stronger food work that any man had seen before. And that changed the face of flamenco. She became really successful, and all the women began imitating her. So that was part of the hybridization of flamenco, in which the masculine and the feminine in her dance became one. So one of the questions I have is, what has taken so long for the men to catch up with the feminine? That's one question. And the other question is, because you see women catch up with the masculine along with the society, right? Mm -hmm. How women were at that time precisely wanting to have more of a masculine Role in society, and that thing was 
presented by Kanye Zan, something that was very timely. However, for men, it's been a recent theme to acquire more of a feminine quality in their dance. And that, that not necessarily means that men have to be gay to wear a shirt, like Paki Cortez. He was dating Naomi Campbell, you know. So it's, I'm not sure that it relates to sexual orientation on, on that end. And I think it's important to analyze. On the other hand, we have always had powerful lesbian women in Spain, like La Paqueta de Jerez, and about you know, openly lesbian with living with a woman, or or Caracaita the Badajoz, openly lesbian, like big time. And this has <laughs> always been, even so during Franco's dictatorship, even during Franco's dictatorship, we have Antonio Malena, gay singer, Llave de Oro del Flamenco, you know, the key goal of flamenco. So, of course, under, under the dictatorship, you have to be like very careful because you could get in big trouble. But still, there was always sexual orientation was never necessarily connected with the way you perform the dance. You know, and I think that right now what's interesting to me is to see the feminine emerging in men, while the masculine in women's dancing has been there for like almost a century now. To the point that women like myself, I yearn for that ancient feminine form that's thoroughly in danger of extinction. Dance of Pastor Imperio, the dance of the Lola Flores, the early dance of the women who were just purely feminine. So that appeals to me, that feminine. And really has nothing to do with sexual orientation, I mean, whatever. So I if that opens. Skip me. You know, a couple of yeah. questions there. <laughs> I'll be brief. Um, I guess to link a few things that you said. Um, Number one, I think the quote, big trouble you reference under the Franco dictatorship, uh, if by big trouble you mean death, then like, sure. Like, and people that were killed or put into concentration camps, especially during the war because of being gay, that's a, that's a huge trouble. So I think when we look at it, it's, it the names you brought up are interesting because from your perspective, Paula, you're Espa Espanol, right? Mm. I think in speaking to certain people now, I don't know if we could consider Mayena and La Paquera as like, as openly gay as we might perceive them to be. Well, maybe not in the, in the newspapers, but everybody knew. So I think that's also in terms of private and public space of what of negotiating that of like who gets to be gay, who is gay, and who's considered that way, and what freedom you have to, and what you what can you lose if you're that open. So Maidena wasn't out there parading himself as a gay man. A lot of the escapades he had were behind closed doors and in the privacy of his own space. Or La Paquera, people knew. But it was there. But then, if you were to sort of ascribe that identity to them, that brings a whole different realm of other things. And Alvaro, who's actually friends with Nino de Elche, Alvaro Romero wants to do a certain project about flamenco lyrics and certain people that have been transgressive in their sexuality, but is, has a lot of fears about doing this because it would be outing people that are like maestros or maestras, like Paquera and Marina, and that there's there's threats of like suing like legal threats of sort of defaming these people by saying that they were lesbian or gay. So I think that's, that's an issue. And, and just to get to your point about masculine and feminine, I think it, it, it results in like a question of power and privilege. So it makes sense that women were allowed to sort of do this or permitted like Carmen Mayo or La Cuenca, because if you look at earlier, there was that map of um, the hierarchy and privilege and access, but if masculine and male is the ideal or, or the power that you're trying to get and gain in society, um, then a woman sort of rising up, that might seem as like it's not, they're pushing the boundaries, but at the end of the day, they're gaining the power and the currency of power within the social norms. By men trying to act more feminine, they're being transgressive and saying masculinity, you're not valid enough for me to want to work with, and I'm gonna to go to sort of like the less powerful Place. I'm going to debase myself. Basically. Yeah, I'm going to debase yeah. myself. And so there's a lot to risk there as a male dancer and the amount of men that performed as straight or as masculine on the stage, even though behind closed, I mean, mighty keep up with that, you know? I mean, like the, the analogy I would draw is even in terms of everyday dress, right? Like women wear pants. How many women in this room are wearing pants, right? No. Totally not a big, exactly, to, exactly. Totally not a big deal now though. How many men in this room are wearing skirts or dresses, 
right? So it's, it's, so it's not it's not just about flamenco. It's you know it's not unique to that thing. It's like it's exactly as you're saying the the, the, the hierarchy and the power around that. Is, it's not on the verge of st- dis- extinction though, and I, I don't know if you caught it in it. Like when some of the purest female dancers say like we're lo- sort of what you've been saying, we're, like, we're losing the femininity. We're not gonna. I yearn for those days. I I am a proponent at times of some of this queer activity only exists with that powerful, purest, traditional aspect also existing, that I'm a queer dancer in New York doing what I'm doing, but we have a lot of traditional stuff happening here in New York, and my stuff exists in counter to that, and there's a lot of traditional stuff here that pushes what? back. Traditional what? Flamenco, I think. Well, I'm, I we would totally love, yeah, this is later. definitely yeah, a conversation definitely we get a lot more later, yeah. because I realize that we now are, um, are left with less than half an hour for lunch. Thank you all so much for this great conversation. I do teach a lot of her work to men. Keep on it. Keep doing it. Make more me's. <laughs> <laughs> all right.